Welcome back to another episode of RM Read. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in for today's episode. Today we have Mrs. Victoria Wolf all the way from North Dakota. Mrs. V- Mrs. Victoria is a grief fighter, Reiki master, and a certified grief recovery specialist. We brought her in today to talk about grief since it's such an important topic to talk about and no one really talks about it much. Yeah, and so maybe we can start with the question, what is grief? Well, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, What is grief? Ah, Grief is the feeling of anything that we wish would have been different, better, or more. Anything that um, it's a loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations. Um, It's reaching out for someone that you wish would be there and, you know, someone that you needed one last time and they're not there. Um, that's how the Grief Recovery Institute um, defines grief. And what's the difference between grief and mourning? I think they're much of the same in a way. Um, and we grieve a lots of things, not just the death of a loved one. Uh, there's many reasons. I mean, COVID really highlighted that for so many people, teens included, um, that are having to stay home and on lockdowns and couldn't go to school and be with their peers. Uh, there's grief in that, you know, so there's lots of ways that we grieve or mourn. Um, it's a sadness, right? Yeah, I'm really glad that we got to talk about grief because it's such an important topic and um, no one really talks about it. So I'm really glad you're here to talk about it. Um, so what are the stages of grief? There are actually no stages of grief. Um, that is a oh. misconception. Yeah. Yeah. So Elizabeth Keebler Ross, um, her work was actually based, which that idea was kind of misconstrued, but her work was actually based on um, these stages that someone goes through when they're diagnosed with a terminal illness. And uh, so as, you know, anger, denial, you know, those, what we, what people tend to think are stages of grief, it's actually stages of um what her work is based on is based around terminal illness. Now, not saying someone who's grieving isn't experiencing those similar emotions or feelings, but grief isn't linear. It's not like this, you feel this way, now you feel that way, now you feel this way, and five years from now, well, I shouldn't feel this way anymore because I've gone through that phase or stage, right? So um, basically, you can take grief and instead of uh, point A to point B, it's more like, you know, can't see this now, but it's like scribbly lines. It's not linear at all. So um, there are no stages. Yeah, uh, yeah, now that I think about it, it makes sense that there's no stages. Yeah, before like there's other, the stages for like other things, but now when you mentioned it, yeah, there's no stages because it's, like it can take how long or it takes. Um, yeah, and I think too, it, it someone might. The danger of that is that, like I said, people might think, "Well, I you've you're grieving already two years. You should be over this by now," you know. Or they might say or think, "Well, it's been a year. Maybe they're past the denial stage." You know, that's the danger of that of applying it to grief. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, so what are some ways that people cope with grief? Huh. Um, well, I think in the ways are really similar across the board, whether you're a, a teen or an adult. Um, I think if you picture yourself or imagine yourself like a tea kettle and, okay, let me, let me backtrack. So as a child, you have a backpack, right? And your dog dies. Okay. You add a, you add a rock to your backpack. That's really sad. That's maybe traumatic for a child. So you put a, you put a rock in your backpack. Well, then maybe your grandma dies. Well, I'm going to add another rock. Maybe your bike is stolen. That's another rock, you know? And so as we get older, we add these rocks to our backpacks. So grief does build up over time. Grief is cumulative and it's cumulatively negative. And so all of those grief experiences that we experience from childhood on kind of build up in our bodies emotionally, that energy kind of gets stuck. And so if we think of ourselves like a tea kettle, um, we either implode or we explode. And when we implode, it affects our body 
physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, we can, um, like for me personally, I had hair loss. I lost weight, a bunch of weight in a short period of time. I had fibromyalgia-like symptoms, like where I just felt achy all over, this overall achiness with no medical reason. Um, I, you know, people can have migraines or um, much disease actually, like dis-ease in the body equates to disease in like that, how it manifests. And so if we don't get that emotional stuff out, then how a lot of people cope too is they resort to behaviors to make them feel better for a short period of time. So you might um, go on Facebook and scroll for two hours. Um, you know, like everyone else's life looks really bad. Okay, I don't feel so bad about mine, you know? Or um, you might binge watch, you know, Netflix or TV uh, or fantasy, fantasy books, um, shopping, gambling, um, partners, intimate, intimate partners. Um, it really gets to the point where you kind of detach from yourself. You really don't, you're unable to tune into what's really going on because it kind of snowballs and it gets out of control. And that's kind of what happens. We're, we're tea kettles for sure. When it comes to grief, it manifests in our bodies and it manifests in our lives. And it's, different and similar, if that makes sense uh, across the board. Yeah. yeah, I think no one can really hold on to so many problems. They'll eventually, you know, as you said, explode or implode. So uh, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, so I was going to ask, do you have a personal way you grieve this Victoria? Well, with the grief recovery method, um, I have the tools and the knowledge to process any relationship that is causing me dis-ease in my life. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about grief recovery is that once you learn it, once you learn it, you have the tools for the rest of your life. Um, because oftentimes too, uh, the people living in our lives cause us grief. Sometimes even the most grief because they're, they're always there. And so there's always going to be some sort of you know, especially if you have problems with boundaries, if um, that's not someone you can really feel safe communicating with, you're always going to have these things that um, really make it difficult to develop a closeness and a connection and a relationship that's deep. And that grief really causes this, makes the separation between not only ourselves, like with our inner selves, but also our relationships. And so it is really important that we continue to work on the relationships in our lives so that we can feel deep connection. And despite whatever the issues are, right, it's coming to a place of, I know that person's not going to change. I know this is, this is just how it is, but I have the tools and the knowledge where I can process what I'm feeling without having to address that person directly. And that's the beautiful thing about grief recovery is you don't have to even have that conversation with the person. You just, you work on yourself and that's, that's the whole idea. Yeah, that's really, really true. I think everyone should listen to that. It's like gonna so that's, that's how I cope. <laughs> <laughs> I continue to use the tools I've learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, so why do you think grief is important to talk about? Why isn't it? <laughs> um, I think it's everywhere and we're not immune. No one is immune and it touches us all. It's the one thing that unites us all. Yeah, that's, that's very true. It, it does unite us all. And as you said, like, you know, some people have it more than others like you don't really know what's going inside of everyone's minds they may look happy on the outside but on the inside they may be grieving and have so many different problems that people don't know about well on the flip side of grief too is that it really costs the economy billions of dollars every year in loss of productivity and um yeah just loss of productivity because if you think about it when you have a lot of issues going on in your life and grief in your life, you're not going to come to work and you're not going to be, you know, operating at hundred percent and not saying you always have to, and you always will, but 
when we are deep in grief, you know, especially with a significant loss, you know, you maybe get four week, four days to a week of paid time off. If maybe it's paid, it might not be. And then you're supposed to come back and be, you know, performing like you did before and people expect you to be how you were before. And that's not the case. And so there's a lot of lack of support within um, our economy when it comes to grief support in the workplace. And so it costs, it costs our economy billions. I guess there isn't that much support when people are, you know, having, uh, going through problems, like they need, you know, their time, but you know, they can't because they have a job, they have to make money somehow. And I think it's really important that people should take care of themselves. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people, um, getting to be like my age in the forties into the fifties that are now taking care of their parents as well. And so, there's, yeah, I think there are so many issues there when it comes to grief that um, we could be doing better. Now, granted, I'm not saying there aren't companies out there that are doing phenomenal things, and there very well could be. I'm just saying overall, like in, I think the statistic was from 2012, it was like, a cra- like ugh, I'm going to get it wrong, but it was, it is in the billions of what it costs our economy. And that was 2012. I can't imagine what it is now today after COVID, you know? Yeah, I feel like a lot of people are grieving wow. so much during this time because it's COVID and a lot of people, like old people especially, they're like dying because of the COVID. So yeah, I, I just wanted to say, so I realized that your website's called The Unleashed Heart. Um, so I thought it was it was really unique and I really liked the sound of it too. So what is it about? Hmm. Well, I actually, in 2014, I kind of had a midlife crisis. Um, I closed, well, the following year, I closed a business and my daughter started kindergarten and I just was feeling, I had a photography studio. I ran a photography business and just felt like I was meant for more. Um, I, I didn't feel as fulfilled as I should have been, even though I was doing really well. Um, and I just felt like something was missing in my life. And she started kindergarten and I closed that business. And I just had this like midlife crisis of what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And um, I started to really, that's when I really started to dig into myself and have some go have introspection. And I spent several years doing that. And in that time, I wrote a book and started a blog called The Guided Heart, where I wrote about personal development, spirituality, faith, things like that. And it evolved into from the guided heart to the unleashed heart. And um, it just came to me one night as I was drifting off to sleep. And I thought, oh, for sure, this is domains taken. And it wasn't. And so I think it was just meant to be. It's, it's, and I really have not felt unleashed really until probably um, until grief recovery, really. I mean, that really opened up my heart and my life to so many. I felt open to possibility really for the first time. I really felt unleashed. And that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's the ability to not let the past be the dictator of your present and your future anymore. It's empowering yourself. It's about empowerment. Yeah. 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 I- I think it's cool that you're helping people who, you know, uh, go through grief. And I think it's really cool how you started this uh, organization or like uh, this, this way that people can, you know, help come and contact you and help you. I wanted to ask, like, how does, how do children, you know, grieve differently than adults? And like, how, yeah, how, how do you help children too? Is it different? compared to adults? Yeah, you know, children, um, I was a child griever. My dad died when I was eight. And so um, I have known grief most of my life. And at that time in the 80s, people really didn't, they didn't talk about grief. Like nobody talked about grief in the 80s. And in culturally too, um, I'm German background. We really don't talk about grief. We don't talk about our feelings. Like, you know, you have to be strong and um, you don't show emotion. You don't, you know, and so... I grew up not showing emotion. Like I would go run and hide to cry. And um, children are all different because we're all different, right? And so you might see a child that might seem like 
they're doing really well. They can wear a smile really well. Um, and you might have children that have anger issues. So because we're all different, it's, but I would say anger is just someone who is hurt. Anger is just sadness, really. And um, I think that we learn, I don't think, I know, we learn by our environment, the examples in our environment. And so if our parents are not emulating a healthy communication around grief um, and how to process and look at it and take in to take care of our hearts in that way, um, we learn. That's how we learn. We're sponges as kids. We're sponges. We take everything in. We're just receptors of information. Um, and it's not necessarily things that are seen. It could be heard or um, lack of emotional connection is huge in childhood because touch is massive when you're growing. I mean, as a baby, you can actually physically die as a baby without touch. Um, you need that connection. And so, and we're wired for connection. And if we're not getting that within the context of grief, it really sets us up for problems in adulthood. And actually there's um, something called the ACE study, adverse childhood experiences. And the more ACEs that you have in your childhood, the more likely you are to um, have addiction and um, behavioral issues and mental illness in adulthood. Um, yeah, it's, the, I mean, the, the, the work that's being done in the research um, in terms of children and grief is very expansive in the ACE study. I uh, highly re recommend anybody who's curious about children and grief to look into that. But um, in the work that I do, I don't, I'm not able to work directly with children because I'm not a licensed therapist. Um, but there are many grief recovery specialists who are and are and who are licensed therapists as well. But I actually facilitate a program that's called Helping Children with Loss that is actually for the adults, um, the adult caretakers or parents. And it's a four week online method. Um, and we meet once weekly for four weeks. And you really learn, you empower yourself as a parent or a caretaker to feel confident that you're doing and saying and being there in the way that you feel that in a way that you, you, you can be for a child who's grieving. Yeah, I feel like when you're a child and let's say you're like six or five or like when you're young, if you're young and you lose someone like your parent or something, I think for example, like orphans, it's really devastating because you know what, at this time of life, like they didn't know, right? Um, like they're living with their adoptive parents but they're like, oh, where are my real parents? So I think, it's like really um, devastating, like when they're young too, because like they can't see their parents and, you know, it's just, that's like a whole um, different story. And like a lot of people say like, um, like my adoption is, it's a beautiful thing, you know, there's nothing to be heard about it or something like that. So yeah, I think like they grieve more when they're young, um, but as they grow older, um, they're able to like overcome it. So which brings to my next question, how do you create a positive and healthy environment around you to overcome the grief? I think it's that word overcome, because I don't know that we ever, it's not about overcoming grief. It's really about learning to live with it differently because grief changes over time. I mean, my grief is very different now than it was when I was eight, right? But that sadness never goes away. My dad is never, like when I got married, he wasn't there. Um, my grand, when my first child was born, he wasn't there. There are these milestone moments that we have throughout our life where that sadness comes back to us, right? It's not going to go away. That sadness doesn't go away. But I don't find myself in a like puddle on the floor and like this emotional state of I can't function for days or if I, I think of a memory that upsets me or makes me sad, like it doesn't like pull me into the past and, and take me out for a few days because I'm just emotionally so distraught. So it's about not necessarily overcoming, but really learning how to cope in a healthy way rather than what we always resorted to before, drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, shopping, you know, all those things or anger or 
you know, physical symptoms. So it's really being able to um, address the grief in a healthy way where it doesn't dictate. It's not the, it's not the captain of your life anymore. You know, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, that did. Um, so if we know someone who is in grief, like how can we help them? Ask, ask how you can help them because everybody's different. Um, I think that they're, you know, sometimes grievers don't even know what they need or want, especially if some, you know, if it's just a recent loss, it's like, you know, maybe they haven't even processed what happened. Um, maybe just give them that time and space and maybe just say that, you know what, I'm going to give you the time and space that you need, but I want you to know that I am here for you. I'm, you know, anytime, text me, call me, um, and maybe don't even put it on them. Maybe just call or text. How are you feeling today? Is there anything that I, that you need that I can pick up for you? I'm at the grocery store. Do you need anything? Um, or, or listen for the cues of, of a friend of what they're saying. Like, oh, I'm just so tired lately. I just, you know, well, if they're really tired, then maybe they don't have the energy to mow their lawn. If they're really tired, maybe they don't have the energy to do the dishes or, if it's, you know, other adults, you know, maybe they need help with carpool or, you know, get a food train going, or um, there's so many practical things. Send a housekeeper, um, pay, for, pay, pay someone to clean the house. Um, there's so many things that we can do uh, that if we just listen, really, it's being open and hearing to what's being said and then responding. Um, but also to respecting that, um, everybody's different and that they may not respond to their grief the same way you would. And that's not right or wrong. It's just how they're dealing with it and not to take it personally. I think that's where a lot of relationships fall away uh, after a devastating loss, because we tend to take things personally. And as grievers, they, you know, I had this discussion not that long ago about, and I actually wrote a blog post about it. Um, or a social post, but as a griever, it's not your, people might, as a griever, you might feel like it's not your responsibility to tell people what they should do or how they should respond. But in essence, it kind of is because if you want your, your grief to be honored in the way that you want it honored, people aren't mind readers. They don't know. They don't know. And so communicating in a way that you feel, in a way that is write for you, whether it be writing a letter, writing an email, like a mass email, writing, a, starting a blog. A lot of grievers I've talked to over the past year, almost a year, have written blogs, um, a place where people can go to see and, and address, and, you know, to, to actually read for themselves on their own time, what's going on. And then they don't have to, you don't feel like you have to like reach out to them. Um, but as a griever, you get to decide how people respond to you and, and help you. And you do have a say in that. And so, but you have to communicate that. I think that's really helpful. Like, especially at this day and age, like everyone's trying to be there for each other. Like you, you never know what that person, you know, might be going through. So I think like, it's really important that you said that. Um, so do you think there's like a, is there like long-term grief? Is there like a specific time people like grief for like this amount of time or like, is there anything like that? Well, when I say the phrase time heals, do you know the rest of it? Time heals. No. <laughs> oh, you don't. Well, there's this, this expression that time heals all wounds. Oh, um, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. See, now, you know, right. Like everybody knows, like everybody's heard that at some point, like time heals all wounds. Like, no, it doesn't. Time just passes. It's the action that we take within time that, that matters. Yeah. And so there's all these, um, there's six myths of loss that we generally as a society are born into and, and learn because it's this generational learning that I kind of spoke about earlier. Like we learn from our, the environment in which we are in. And so it's don't feel bad, replace the loss, grieve alone, be strong keep busy and time heals all wounds. So no, there is no time frame to grief. Yeah, I think 
I think everyone should realize that too. Like if people know people, some people are going to grieve, they should know like, you know, it takes time. It, 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 like even if it takes, you know, a couple months to a year, you, you can't say like, oh, aren't you over this yet? Like, I think that if you say that, that would really hurt them because and because it's really important to them, you know? So I think you should, everyone should know that, you know, grieving isn't, it lasts. Like it, it changes over time, as you said, but it's always uh, in there. And, and let um, me address too, like, I, again, before I found grief recovery, I was a griever for over 30 years. Over 30 years of my life, I had not addressed the grief in my life. Yeah. And it created a lot of problems throughout my life because of it. So it isn't, it wasn't until I took action to address that grief that my life changed. So that's why I say time just passes, whether it's 30 years, 13 or three. But if you take no action, those years will really pass. Yeah, for me, it took like almost two years. Like my granddad passed away like all of a sudden. And like, I still remember like, um, I think it was like after school, like um, my mom, so I'm the last person she picks me up because I'm in high school and then my sister is in um, junior high. Oh, actually at the time it was elementary, never mind. I'm um, in like sixth grade. So I remember like when I got in the car, she just all of a sudden like cried, like, and she was driving too. So I was like, what happened mom? Like what happened? And she like told me everything like, and we just quiet for like the entire car ride. And it was like, I remember like it took me almost two years and like for her also it took like maybe a few months and then like my family and stuff like that. So I kind of know like how, like how, like there are different ways to um, cope with it. And also like, like you said, time doesn't heal wounds. Like it takes time and yeah. Yeah, it takes action. Mm -hmm. yeah. It takes action. I'm yeah, sorry. I also, yeah, I was going to say, I also had a similar experience too. Yeah, my great grandparents also passed away a couple of years ago. And it, yeah, it was actually, it's very hard on us, you know, uh, in talking to our family and like everyone's going through the same thing. And yeah, so yeah, I've also experienced. Yeah, this. and you know, everyone will, like in a family, in the context of family and grief and loss, people, the whole family will they're experiencing the same thing, but everyone will experience it differently. And that's the point too, I want to get across is that we can experience the same loss as someone else. Like we can have a sibling that we, we both had a parent pass away, but our experiences are very different because that relationship was different. Yeah, that's true. Like my mom had a different relationship than mm -hmm. me. Yeah. So uh, moving on, we wanted to talk about Reiki. Uh, that's a type of healing process that you do, right? So do you want to talk about what that is? Oh, I love Reiki energy healing. Yeah, it's a, um, yep, it's a Japanese healing modality. It's been around for since the 1900s, um, early 1900s. There is a lot of lineages for Reiki. I am an Asui Holy Fire Reiki master, and then I'm a Karuna Holy Fire Reiki master. And Karuna is its own, it's not a part of Asui. Um, it's its own, lin it's like its own type of Reiki. Uh, but yeah, I am a Reiki master. I could teach Reiki also. Um, I haven't gone down that path yet, but I could also be a teacher if I wanted to be. Wow, that's really cool. Cause like, I don't really know anything about Reiki. And then my mom was saying like, I'm like, oh yeah, we're interviewing, you know, Victoria. And she's like, a grief uh, specialist and also like a Reiki, a Reiki master and she's like oh my god I've always wanted to do, Re do Reiki so I always wanted like what is Reiki and stuff like that yeah it's um how do I explain it <laughs> it's really hard to explain because it's something that's so hard to explain it is it's great for stress reduction um it really just allows the body like the synthetic synth Pathetic nervous system to really relax and so that our bodies can do what it naturally does and that's heal and um, so it's not claiming like I would never claim to heal you it, but it allows your body to do what it naturally does from the inside out and um, but it's wonderful st for stress reduction for anxiety um, it's actually becoming more mainstream now that's it's actually with used with in more than 700 hospitals in the United States. Um, it's becoming very much more acceptable or common uh, for cancer treatment patients. Um, yeah, it's, it's really opened my eyes to 
to the energy of emotions and the energy that we store in our bodies because of emotions. And um, it's because of grief recovery that I felt like led to Reiki, I believe. I felt more, I was more open to it, <clears throat> excuse me, because I had never experienced a Reiki session in my life. I'd never really even knew about it myself. Uh, when I went to get certified, I just felt this. And most people who are Reiki masters, they go into Reiki because they feel a calling to it. It's because they feel drawn to it. Um, and so if the, the universe keeps nudging you on the head, like Reiki, 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 or you keep seeing it, or you keep hearing it everywhere, perhaps it's a nudge to listen to. And that's what happened for me. Like I just kept hearing about it and, you know, like randomly. And I'm like, what is Reiki? And so that's what set me off and talking with people, other Reiki masters. And um, I found my teacher and she's phenomenal. There's only 30 licensed Reiki masters in the world. And one of them was my, is my teacher. And so I feel very blessed with that. Wow. So yeah, I love Reiki. Yeah. I have a Reiki session this afternoon, actually. So oh, yeah, wow. oh, that's cool. You can, yeah. And it knows no time or space. And so I've had Reiki sessions with clients in Australia, in um, South Korea, um, Canada, anywhere in the United States. Um, yeah, it's, it, it knows no time or space. And so I can, because I'm a, a Reiki master, I can do distance Reiki. Um, actually, when you are Reiki one and two certified, you can then do distance Reiki. Um, but as a Reiki master too, I can do distance Reiki or in person. And so, yeah. Yeah. So what, what's a typical, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. What is a typical session of Reiki like? Well, every Reiki practitioner is different and the lineages might be just a little different too. I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with any other lineage other than a Sui. Um, but for a Reiki session with me, it's, I don't touch some Reiki practitioners um, put hands on and touch the certain areas of the body. I don't feel the energy that way as much. Like I feel it more so just kind of hovering. I don't feel like I need to touch. Actually, I feel it turning on just as I'm talking about it. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, it's yeah, it's um, a lane of hands that we call, and you just have these different body positions or positions that you hold over the body. And, um, and because every pr practitioner is different, I, what comes up for me oftentimes, um, every session is different. I can have a session with someone every month and every session is very different. Um, I've had sessions where I've removed really deep emotional blocks um, I've had sessions where a specific organ has come up. Um, oftentimes it's chakras that come up for me um, and like emotional stuff. Um, I'm very much, I'm an empath myself. I'm an empath. So I take on, I can easily take on other people's energy, but I can really feel other people's emotional energy and their emotional state and what's going on. Um, but I also have a medical background. And so I do find that sometimes medical things come up um like just um like like i said certain organs or things like that so yeah every session is different it's I'm, i love it and yeah this is for everyone right children kids and seniors absolutely yeah i have children mm -hmm. that come to me yep for yeah. sure that's really cool <laughs> it does no uh, harm reiki does mm -hmm. no harm it's love and light energy it's just pure love and light energy i am just the conduit um i it's not me. It's not me doing, it's not me. It's, you know, and some people, that's where people struggle with it. Maybe it's like this, this higher power, this, um, okay. we, I use God. I, you know, I'm, I resonate with God. And so it's, it's this pure love and light God loving energy for me. Some people might say universe or this higher higher being or, you know, brothers and sisters of the light, you know, just um, people that passed before us and, you know, are enlightened beings now because they're not on the physical plane. Um, we could really go deep. 
<laughs> with all of that. But it really has opened me up personally to spirituality and just how we're all connected. Just we, we are all, everything, everything is energy. Everything. We are made up of energy on a cellular mm -hmm. level. Yeah, I think that's a really cool way of healing. Yeah, when Varsha ma mentioned Reiki, I was also like, uh, what's Reiki? I've never uh, heard of it. Then I did more research. I'm like, oh, it's a healing process. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very fascinating uh, to, you know, a fascinating way to heal. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, moving on. So you have a podcast too. It's called the Grieving Voices Podcast. So why did you start this podcast? And like, what's the message that you want to give to your listeners? Yeah, I started Grieving Voices because I wanted us society to talk about grief like we talk about the weather. And um, I wanted to give grievers the time and space um, with a safe person as myself to share their story and um, where they won't be analyzed, criticized, or judged. And um, many of my listeners have come back and shared that it was very therapeutic for them. Um, not listeners, guests have said that it was therapeutic for them. And um, yeah, I just, and I'm really passionate about the education piece because we are so uneducated <laughs> around grief. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very passionate about the grief piece. And so I try to incorporate that into the questions that I ask. I do, it's very conversational style. I, I don't have a tight script or anything like that, but it, I do, there are certain questions that they choose that they want to answer that answer those questions for other people. Like what was helpful as a griever? Like what was helpful for me? Um, what are some things that people did that I appreciated? What are some unhelpful or hurtful things that people said? You know, so it's, it's, through story, other grievers can hear themselves and other people or can see themselves in other people's stories, but also someone who's wanting to support a griever will receive an education based on that story. So there's something for everyone, I think, in every episode. And it's really bringing hope that despite life's circumstances in our experiences, which I've interviewed some people whose life experiences have been horrendous, the next episode coming out this next Tuesday, um, she it's very much a hero's journey story. And um, she should have been dead by the time she was 16. Um, I couldn't believe she was talking to me, but instead she got her PhD in creative arts um, and creative writing or yeah, creative arts. But yeah, she's a phenomenal woman. Um, I've just met so many incredible people who have who are beacons of hope now because they have taken their story and they have not allowed it to take them down in life. They've really trans transformed it and um, made it something for the good of others and themselves. Yeah, I think it's really important that you started the podcast because as you said, not many people are educated um, of grief and like other things. So it's really nice that you started. So check the grieving voices podcast we'll put the link down in the description so you guys can listen to it so i had one more question going back to reiki so do you like use crystals like i realized that um in reiki you use crystals so can you maybe talk a little bit about that and the significance of it hmm. i don't personally incorporate crystals into my sessions um, I never really even like my point of view of crystals is like okay it's a rock <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like I, I'm still yeah. like, even still like, okay, I'm not so sure about this, but what's interesting is that I have what's called a Reiki grid and on this grid, I have different crystals and, but because everything is energy, right. And everything holds a frequency crystals do too. And so it's really, um, I actually have like Palo Santo is my absolute favorite essential oil. Um, but I have a Palo Santo bracelet and, you know, it's from, it's a very sacred wood. And, um, but for some reason, I just feel better <laughs> when I'm wearing this bracelet because it, it kind of wards off negative energy. It's a purifier. Um, 
And so I think there's something said about it, but I think too, you have to, it's like this belief, right. That you have to have, I think within you as well. It's, it's, and you know, it's a lot of, I think our mental point of view or our, like how we, how do I want to say this? Let's say someone is diagnosed with a terminal illness. Okay. And, but they believe like, I'm going to beat this. Like I'm, and they like visualization is, is so important when it comes to healing um, in terms like, okay. So Louise Hay, if you've never heard of Louise Hay, she cured herself of a really terminal cancer. Um, she had a, I think it was um, uterine cancer, but every day she would visualize this cancer being washed away by water. Like this water would purify her body and wash it away. And she did no other treatments, I believe. It's um, You Can Heal Your Life is her book where she talks about it. But the, just your mind doesn't know the difference between reality or fiction, right? And so if you're visualizing it, it's, and then we, you know, you can go into manifestation and all this and that. But I think there's something to it in that if you believe, I mean, what does it matter? <laughs> You know, so if you believe a crystal is going to help you, does it really matter if, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? Like it'll help you if you think it's going to help you. Um, yeah. I don't incorporate them into my sessions, but there's lots of things that can be incorporated into a Reiki session that I haven't really even dived into yet. I'm just really, um, I'm really actually more interested in like the Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine and and the different um, points of our bodies and the yin and the yang. Um, and so I'm more interested in the, like the medical aspect of Reiki and, and um, healing in that way when it comes to traditional Chinese medicine. But um, I haven't been led to the, the crystals within Reiki yet. And that's where every, like I said, every Reiki practitioner is different, but there's people that use pendulums. Um, I haven't really played with that yet. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an evolving practice. And so every practitioner is different. Did that answer your question? I know it's probably a really long winded way to answer it, but (laughs) I just think it comes down to belief really. Yeah. I think believing it's, it's a strong, strong thing. If if Mm -hmm. you believe in something, you know, as you said, like with, uh, that lady, Louis, Hayes? Louise Hayes, Louise Louise Hayes. Hayes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting how she thought, thought of that way. So yeah, I think if you believe something, it's very important, very valuable. Actually, me. I think it, Louise Hay. Louise Hay. Louise Hay. Okay, yeah. Louise Hay. <laughs> uh, so we were actually on your website, and we saw a quote that says, um, "It is never too late to start again and again and again if you need to." And like we were both really like you know inspired by that, and like we thought like, "Wow, that's such an inspirational message." So we wondered, you know, like how did you der- derive this message? Mm. I'm glad you gals pointed that out. Um, and picked up on that because I think there is this idea that, well, for me personally, I felt like my, how I was feeling when I was at my lowest, like, this is just how I'm going to feel. Like, this is just how it is. Like life is just going to suck in this way for the rest of my life. And, um, I just found myself repeating these same patterns of behavior and these, the cyclic, like, they're the cyclic, um, the issue, same issues just keep kept reoccurring in my life. I was abusing alcohol in my early twenties and I was still in, as a mother, I would resort to alcohol to feel better. Um, I'm now sober over a year. I completely 100% gave up alcohol overnight. Literally I decided, and I never had a drop since. Wow. Um, and I did that with the help of grief recovery because I worked on my relationship to alcohol. And that's the beautiful thing about it too, is you can apply grief recovery to other things other than just relationships and people. Um, but I applied it to el- my relationship with alcohol because it is a relationship, just like we have a relationship to our bodies and to food. Um, and so I worked through that relationship that way and also through Reiki. And so that's how I was able to give up alcohol, I think, in the way that I did. Um, now I wasn't a daily drinker, um, but I was a frequent drinker and it wasn't just a glass of wine. It would be a bottle of wine. And the question I asked myself was, why do I need this? 
why do I feel like I need this? And um, so to answer your question, to never, it's never too late to start again and again and again, if you need to, it's this, just don't give up. You can't give up. You know, you fall off the wagon one day, tomorrow's a new day. Start again. Yeah, I think people tend to think like, you know, once you give up, you know, they give up, like they stop, you know, doing whatever they wanted to do. Because, you know, giving up is such like uh, a low, you know, you're just like, uh, you know, I can't do this anymore. And, you know, you just stop. So I think that's very important not to give up. Yeah, you just haven't found something that works. That's it. You just haven't found something that sticks. You know, it's like spaghetti. You just got to keep throwing spaghetti at the wall until something sticks. And for me, it was grief recovery that that stuck and Reiki has stuck. Um, so, yeah. I think that's like a really great way to put it. Um, I also like the quote that you said, it's never too late to start again and again and again if you need to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really cool. Um, so, yeah. So I realized that you wrote a book and it's called The Guided Heart. Yeah, I wrote that when I started that blog or it was maybe a couple of years after I started that blog. Um, and it was me diving into my loss of my father and, and the other traumas I experienced after that. And um, it was very therapeutic for me. But during the editing phase of that book, I had another loss actually that opened up all the wounds of that loss of my father. And um, that's actually for another book, I think. But um, yeah, it's, it's really just my story. Um, trying to share what I learned in the process and what helped me along the way. But what I know now, looking back, is those things really didn't help me to recover from the grief. They helped me evolve as a person and they helped me kind of dig deeper into myself but they didn't address the grief. And that's what I look in hindsight now is, yeah, you know, I, these certain programs or these books or mentors or people or what have you that I discovered in those years before writing the book or as I was writing it really, um, it, none of it addressed the grief. And that was really the heart of my issue was my grief and trauma because trauma happens and grief is what's left. Yeah, that's really interesting yeah, how you wrote a book on it. Yeah, we'll also link the book and the podcast down below. So make sure you guys check it out. Uh, so on your website, I also noticed that you have blogs too. So do you also uh, write stuff like about grief and like educate people on it too? Yes, I have a yeah. weekly blog post that I publish mm -hmm. every Friday. Although I did miss last week, Friday. And that's the only second blog post I've missed in like two years. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, it's just been really crazy. Like March, I'm calling this, I'm hashtag March madness <laughs> in my life. This month has been crazy, but um, yeah, I have a weekly blog post. I have a weekly newsletter. I send out every Wednesday. However, it is going to buy weekly just because I've, um, I did a survey and I have a lot going on in my life. And I just feel like bi-weekly would give more substance. I'd be able to give more substance to my newsletter. So that's going to be bi-weekly starting on the 17th of March. Um, and then I have the weekly podcast episode that comes out every Tuesday. Um, yeah, and I work with clients online and in person, uh, both with grief recovery and with Reiki. And yeah, so I got lots going on, but I, I love it. It's this is my alignment. I'm in full alignment, I'm living mm -hmm. my passion for sure. <laughs> yeah, you do so. You do so many different things to educate about grief in so many different ways. I think that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we will link her a, a website down below if you, you want to contact her or, you know, uh, get any more information. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we actually have uh, some questions from our listeners. Um, so one of our listeners asked, are there any medications to eliminate grief or like to help with grief? Hmm. Well, I think there is something, I'm not a mental health professional uh, licensed. Um, I don't dispense medication, um, but if you're speaking to like clinical depression, um, that's kind of a deeper thing that needs probably medical intervention um, in terms of medication. Um, I've interviewed someone, a great episode on clinical depression is 
there's an episode I did with a um, gentleman named David Woods Bartley. He did, I actually split it into two parts because it was like a two hour conversation on suicide prevention. Um, he struggled with clinical depression and um, still struggles with clin clinical depression. It's not something that just goes away, right? And so he, he's, you know, takes care of himself in all sorts of ways, not just with medication, but um, and he struggled with suicidal ideation as well. And it was going to attempt to, he was going to jump off a bridge and someone intervened. And um, so now he's a speaker on the topic. Um, that's a great episode to look to for clinical depression insight. Um, I think we can have moments in time in our lives where we feel depressed or we can be in a depressive state um, I experienced postpartum depression after my second and third child, and it was much worse after my third child. Um, and the first thing that the doctor, the nurse practitioner wanted to do was put me on an antidepressant, and she did. And I tried it, and it did. It, I took myself off of it. Um, I did not intuitively, that was not what I needed. What I knew, what I did need was I needed grief recovery, <laughs> actually, is what I needed. I needed to address the grief that I had that was coming up again in the postpartum depression that I was experiencing. I also have, used to always have um, issues with seasonal depression. Sometimes it can be a seasonal thing um, where we get more depressive during, you know, when there's not as much sunlight and because sunlight's huge, sunlight is huge. And so if you live in the Northern hemisphere, like I do, um, I had a sad light, they call it a sad light, seasonal affective disorder, um, ooh, excuse me. I have a light for that, um, that greatly helped me. It helps to resync your, your sleep cycle and things like that. But I'm finding I don't even need that as much. Um, interestingly, I haven't given that much thought, but yeah, ever since I've really processed my grief, it's changed my life. It's changed every area of my life. And so I think it's not necessarily a medication that you need. Sometimes you just need a process and a structure and a framework and the right support to address yeah. the grief. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so I think it's really important for people, you know, to process grief. They need uh, they need to find a process. So our last uh, question is actually from our script writer. So she asked, so there's a new Marvel show on Disney Plus. I don't know if you guys heard, but it's called Wand WandaVision or something. But anyways, uh, if you guys haven't watched it, please go watch the before I say this. It's like kind of like a spoiler, I guess. I haven't watched it myself. But anyways, um, she said that WandaVision had gained immense popularity and support over the past few weeks. And one line spoken on the show resonated with a lot of fans all over the world. And the line was, what is grief if not love preserving? How do you feel about, res how do you resonate with this line? And how true does it stand? Hmm. Well, we grieve because we love, right? That's what grief comes from is a place because we love. And that's why we grieve. And um, so the line, the part of if not love preserving, I think it's just this idea of, I think that's what kind of holds people back from actually wanting to address their grief because they feel, might feel like, this is what we see in grief recovery is the resistance to addressing the grief is often because they're afraid that if they let go or they process that somehow they'll forget or somehow it's dishonoring. You know, it's almost like this, I'm honoring my loved one because I'm just in this emotional state of such deep loss. But you can't see the label from inside the jar. And so when you are in that state and it goes on and on and on throughout your life, 30 plus years, for example, you don't see how it's negatively impacting every area of your life. You don't see how it's keeping you from, it's blocking you really from your own truth, from your own who you are on the inside your potential kind of gets stifled. You don't feel like you can fully express yourself. You, you don't really fully express yourself because you've got this veil of grief that's just like blocking you. 
So when you look in the mirror, you don't see you, you see the grief. And so there it's, and it's out of fear and that a lot of people, why they don't want to address their grief. It's this fear, but that's what I love about grief recovery is it's seven or eight weeks. It's a time frame, And you know that you're going to get, there's an end, there's an end date. It's not like you're going to go to support groups for 12 years, which I've known gravers who've gone to support groups for 12 years. You don't need that. It's, you know, you don't have to go week after week and say the same story and go home and feeling terrible because you're hearing other people's sad story. You know, you take in that energy and you're, if you're hearing just sad story after sad story and how does that make you feel better? How does that move you forward? It doesn't. And so I think that it's this idea of, well, if I'm holding on to this, I'm preserving that love. But really you're blocking yourself from it. You're blocking yourself from being able to love fully yourself and other people who are living around you. Yeah, that's very interesting how you put it. Yeah, I didn't really think about that well, until you spoke more about it. And yeah, it's, yeah there's, it's very deep you, if you think about it. And it is very deep. Yeah. And I can say that because I'm on the other side of it. But when you're not and you're deep in it, you can't see to the other side. And that's why, too, I feel like my podcast is hope because it's people on the other side of it, or it's people who are actively working to get to the other side of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. Wow, I think we covered a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your time and having mm -hmm. me on, and mm -hmm. um, you two are doing a wonderful thing too, so thank you for the work that you do. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for joining. This is very, it was very interesting talk. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, before the podcast, I didn't really know what this was going to be about, you know, because I, I wasn't as educated as before now. So yeah, I think this is a really good talk to have. And I think it's very, it's going to be really good to our listeners too. Great. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this interview. Um, it was really insightful and like enlightening. So I, and I enjoyed it, every minute of it. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as always, thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it and stay tuned for more. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more fun and entertaining episodes. Special guests will be aired on YouTube and other collabs will be on other broadcasting platforms. Visit our website, megaversion.com and email us at megaversion2020 at gmail.com. Uh, uh, if you have any media or inquiry requests, um, email us. Um, feedback is always appreciated. Yeah, so we will link uh, Miss Victoria's uh, website below and you can uh, look through her website to find her podcast blogs and her services and so make sure to check that out. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Victoria, for joining. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. It's me, Varsha. And Mega. Signing off. <laughs>